All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for coming out to Darby Creek. I'm uh, going to open up with a couple verses in Isaiah this morning, talking about the foolishness of idols. <clears throat> it says, this is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord of Heaven's armies. I am the first and the last. There is no other God who is like me. Let him step forward and prove to you his power. Let him do as I have done since ancient times, when I established a people and explained its future. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purposes for you long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any other God? No, there is no other rock, not one. Amen. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank him for who he is. <clears throat> God, we just, we love you, God. We thank you that you're the one and only God and we want to worship you today. Thank you that there is truly no one like you. Thank you that you have established your people. You've established us as your people through Jesus uh, from long ago. Uh, you've called out our purpose to, to be your witnesses and to, to give you glory in this world. And pray that you'd help us to remember who we are as your children and, and help us to do what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you're comfortable standing, let's stand on up. I'm going to worship the Lord here.
like our God. It's good to see. All right, this is Revelation 4, verse 11. It says, You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. Let's sing, You're worthy of my praise.
what you ever see. See, we can never let our live stream operators all go on vacation on the same weekend because this is what you get, you know, <laughs> the ping pong. No vacations anymore. So anyway, it's okay. Um, you know, that school supply thing, we hear back from, we get a thank you note almost every year from the school. They really appreciate it. There are kids in need there for sure. And so it, it, is, a, it is a way to serve our community and, and uh, be the hands and feet of Jesus to folks. So um, let's, let's uh, go ahead and, and let's pray. Let's go to the Lord, ask for his, his grace, his blessing here on our time in the word. Lord, we do thank you for uh, just the opportunity to gather together as a church body uh, and be in united prayer this last weekend. Thank you so much that uh, you, know, you just you pour out a blessing where your people are gathered together there. You say where two or three are gathered together uh, in your name, there you are in their midst. So there's some sort of special uh, blessing presence there when we gather in your name and uh, even just agreeing together on all those prayer cards. And Laura, we just... Um, <clears throat> just pray also just for our church family here, that we have people that are, that are really uh, suffering from illness, physical illness. We pray, God, that you would heal them, you would touch their bodies, and we ask and pray that you would strengthen them, those that need just a spiritual strengthening. Maybe they're feeling weary. Uh, help them to persevere. God, help us to uh, be there for each other, to encourage one another, as it says, day after day, as long as it is called today, until the Lord comes back. We need uh, to be connected. We need to be encouraging and challenging and lifting each other up, bearing one another's burdens. Lord, help us to fulfill that, uh, our, our ministry role to one another. And so, Lord, I just pray to you now, you'd fill me, help me uh, as we get into your word this morning and we ask and pray a blessing as your word goes out. Lord, help us to hear, have ears to hear, and to take it in, to allow your spirit to work on us individually and collectively as a church. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so <clears throat> this morning, you know, we're continuing on through this series. We've been doing a series uh, on First Kings, uh, the, the kind of the second part of it. Uh, the first part mainly is surrounding uh, King Solomon and his reign. And then we have, uh, starting with uh, chapter 12, we jump back in and did the, are working our way through the second half. And today really has to do about um, indecision. Indecision. Have you ever kind of just weren't sure what to do uh, about a particular situation? Or, I mean, you can... Uh, I know Linda and I sometimes we're, we're, uh, we'll be like, you know, if we're just relaxing, we'll, we'll be like, you know, what do you want to watch? You want to watch something on TV? What do you want to watch? I don't know what do you want to watch. What do you want to watch? I don't know. And we go back and forth, you know, and there's this indecision. Now, now that's just really minor. Uh, the people in here had, a, had, a, had, a, had a, some indecision about who they were going to serve, which God they were going to serve. They were trying to kind of mix it up, like thinking, I can have the best of the Lord God, the God of Israel, and maybe mix in some of the cultural worship that was going on with Baal and, and this false god Baal. We talked about him last week. And so there's indecision going on. And really the crux of this uh, chapter revolves around a question that the prophet Elijah poses to all the people of God who are gathered. And basically he's just saying, if the Lord is God, follow him. You know, if Baal's gone, follow him. But whoever's the real God, follow him, right? Uh, wholeheartedly, not this trying to mix things in, you know, a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of the world, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. No, all in, right, on the one true God. Whoever that is, is he's saying, okay? And so that's where we find ourselves. We also find ourselves at this time, you may remember, that Elijah issued uh, a judgment on behalf of God over his people because they had been worshiping false gods. And the judgment was a drought. It said there would be neither rain nor dew for three years, right? And so this is what's happening. So they're in the middle of a drought. And then we drop right in here 
And I'm just going to kind of do this in chunks here as we go through this, this chapter, okay? We're going to look at the first 18 verses first here. Let me just read them for you. And a lot of times, uh, I'm usually in the ESV version, but today, when, since I'm reading large chunks of Scripture, I'm in the NLT. It's a little bit more easily heard uh, in large portions. So listen to this. It says, so this is 1 Kings 18, verse 1. It says, Later on in the third year of the drought, the Lord said to Elijah, Go and present yourself to King Ahab. Tell him that I will soon send rain. So Elijah went to appear before Ahab. Meanwhile, the famine had become very severe in Samaria. So Ahab summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace. So here we have a new character on the scene, Obadiah. This Obadiah is different from the prophet Obadiah. Okay, it's different. And it ha in my Bible here, in the NLT, it has a, a parenthesis, and it says, Obadiah was a devoted follower of the Lord. Once when Jezebel had tried to kill all the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had hidden 100 of them in two caves. He put 50 prophets in each cave and supplied them with food and water. So Jezebel, Ahab's wife, uh, has a reputation of her own. Uh, of, you know, just wanting to slaughter all of God's prophets, the true God's prophets, because she was a Baal worshiper uh, and worshiper of Asherah. And so, and so she was like, you know, because, you know, the Lord God, the God of Israel, is not going to put up with any mixing and matching. Uh, he, he's a jealous God, right? We know. And so, so she is searching the land for any prophets of the Lord God and, and trying to round them up and killing them. And so what this guy, Obadiah, did was he hid some in caves, right? And, you might, and, and fed them and gave them water. Now, you might think, well, that's not a big deal. It is if you're in the middle of a drought, right? Uh, and it is if you're a civil servant of the king doing all his business, whatever that might be, and you're out off, to, off and going to the caves on a regular basis bringing food and water when it's scarce, right? This is definitely a big deal and a very courageous act on Obadiah's part. Verse 5, Ahab said to Obadiah, um, he says, we must check every spring and valley in the land to see if we can find enough grass to save at least some of my horses and mules. Do you see a problem with that? Hmm. Oh, the heck with the people. Save my horses and mules, right? I mean, this, this king is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a good king in God's eyes whatsoever, right? Uh, so he's just all looking out for his, his livestock, right? So he wants uh, Obadiah to help him look for places where his animals can graze, that there might be some grass left, right? So verse 6, so they divided the land between them. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. So they split up. As Obadiah was walking along, he suddenly saw Elijah coming toward him. Obadiah recognized him at once and bowed low to the ground before him. Is it really you, my lord Elijah, he asked. Yes, it is, Elijah replied. Now go and tell your master, Elijah is here. All right, so he's just saying, I've, I've got a message for your boss. Tell him I'm here. Seems pretty simple enough, doesn't it? Not so. Verse 9, oh, sir, Obadiah protested, what harm have I done to you? that you are sending me to your death at the hands of Ahab. For I swear by the Lord your God that the king has searched every nation and kingdom on the earth from end to end to find you. Right? Well, why would he be trying to find him? He wants to kill him. Why? He started this whole drought nonsense. Right? <laughs> Let's just get rid of this guy. Maybe that'll solve the problem. Right? Uh, and, 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 so as, and, um, and then it goes on to say, and each time he was told by these people that they want to try to find Elijah on, uh, from, Elijah isn't here. King Ahab forced the king of that nation to swear to the truth of his claim. In other words, swear to me you're not hiding him, right? And now you say to me, Elijah, go and tell your master Elijah is here. But as soon as I leave, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you away to who knows where. I read that and I'm like, what is with that? Elijah is a very strange character and prophet. He somehow has the ability to just, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's mean like disappearing, but just 
Or maybe he does, I don't know. But he has the reputation of slipping away. Otherwise, why would he say that, right? He's like, I know the Spirit of God is going to come and whisk you away. I'll go tell the boss, and you'll be gone, and I'll be called a liar, and I'll be dead, right? This is basically his logic. He says, but as soon as I leave, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you away to who knows where. When Ahab comes and cannot find you, he will kill me. Yet I have been true servant of the Lord all my life. Has no one told you, my Lord, about the time when Jezebel was trying to kill the Lord's prophets? I hid 100 of them in two caves and supplied them with food and water. And now you say, go and tell your master Elijah is here. Sir, if I do that, Ahab will certainly kill me. So you can see, he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me, man. I mean, you can't miss the message here. He's afraid for his life. This is not just delivering a message. Uh, to him, he's like, you know, think about Obadiah. He's really in an interesting position, right? He's serving a guy that's mixing and matching religion, right? And he knows that the drought has come because of their idolatry. Uh, we don't know if he's compromised to be in this position. We have no idea. It does say, you know, the commentary about Obadiah here, though, it did say he was a devoted follower of the Lord. So, well, it's interesting. So he so as it, go, as it goes on here, Elijah, though, gives him a promise. He says, verse uh, 15, But Elijah said, I swear to you by the Lord Almighty, in whose presence I stand, that I will present myself to Ahab this very day. In other words, I'm not going to slip away. I'll be here, going to have a meeting with your boss. Okay? Verse 16, So Obadiah went to tell Ahab that Elijah had come, and Ahab went out to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, this is interesting, so is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? I mean, this is just interesting. You troublemaker, you know, you're the guy that brought all this, this drought to us, right? And, and so then he just, let's just finish out this part here through verse 18. It says, um, Verse 18 says, I have made, and so the response is, I have made no trouble for Israel. Elijah replied, you and your family are troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. Isn't that interesting? A lot of finger pointing going on here, right? A um, couple of things when I, when I look at this passage, and I, I'm really kind of centering uh, the application of how we might apply this to our lives on one thing, and that is following God, following, you know, followers of Jesus. Because he's basically laying down the gauntlet in this whole chapter about who you're going to follow, right? And I think we can learn some things about following God, following Jesus. And so the first thing we can learn, I see here, is that don't be surprised by the hatred of the world. Don't be surprised by the hatred of the world. You know, Jezebel and Ahab were systematically seeking and killing the prophets of the Lord, right? Well, um, Jesus, uh, people saw Jesus as a threat, right? Oftentimes, uh, people, uh, if they haven't really read their Bible, they think, you know, no, Jesus, Jesus was loved by everybody. No, he wasn't. <laughs> he was hated by a lot of people, okay? Uh, if you look here in Luke chapter 23, verses 2 and 5, and you'll see some people giving commentary on Jesus. It says, and they began to accuse Jesus, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding, forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Verse 5, but they were urgent, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, uh, Judea from Galilee even to this place. And so they're saying, this guy's a troublemaker. Jesus is a troublemaker, Right? Um, and so Jesus was called a troublemaker. People didn't like him. Uh, we know they didn't like him to the point of killing him and nailing him to a cross, right? The Apostle Paul encountered plenty of persecution himself for standing up for the truth. Uh, Acts chapter 24, verse 5 speaks of him. It says, for we found this man, meaning Paul, we found this man, Paul, a plague. <laughs> I just like to be called a plague, right? <laughs> Yeah. One who stirs up riots, even among all the Jews, throughout the world, and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Right? Plenty of people hated Paul. Right? Plenty of people hated Paul. 
And Jesus told his disciples, he said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And I think this passage um, reminds us that, you know what? You can't be a friend of the world and a friend of God at the same time. It's challenging, isn't it? Uh, There's a lot uh, that's trying to get our attention in the world. and, And we're not talking about here you know, holding up in a missile silo somewhere out west, you know, waiting for Jesus to come back. We, we want to live, uh, you know, amongst the, the world because that's who we're sent to. We're sent to love people and, and share the gospel with them. We want them to know the living God through Jesus Christ. And so we're not talking about isolation here, but we're talking about not trying to incorporate the things that are of the world into our lives that are not going to be compatible with living for Jesus, okay? And so here we have this first thought here of just don't be surprised by the hatred of the world, okay? Uh, If you're a a peacemaker type person like me, this is not great news. You know, you like people to like you, it's, you just can't, it's just not going to happen. You just got, we just got to get over that, right? Some people will have the other type of personality where, you know, bull in a china shop, they don't care who likes them, you know? Um, and, and so you, you just have to gear up for this, that it's going to happen, all right? Now, uh, the second thing to take away, I think, from this first uh, pass, passage, the verses 1 to 18, is that uh, we're supposed to live a lifestyle of repentance and accepting responsibility. What do I mean by that? Well, it's the whole troublemaker thing, right? Uh, Ahab pointing the finger, in a sense, at um, <clears throat> Elijah saying, you troublemaker! Well, the problem wasn't Elijah. Elijah was the messenger, right? The problem was Ahab, but he wanted to blame shift. He was not owning his own sin He would not repent of his worship of Baal. I don't know, we don't know why. He just didn't. He did not respond, uh, you know, in humility and repentance. But as followers of Jesus, you know, we need to live our our lives to realize that we're going to just be living a lifestyle of repentance, okay? Meaning when we um, fall into sin or we, we start to stray from the Lord, uh, we need to, you know, we, we need to just acknowledge that and repent and turn to God, right? And to, to turn from sin and turn to God. And so this is just going to be a regular thing. You know why? Because we're still sinners. When you become a Christian and put your faith in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, we still have indwelling sin. We still have things we struggle with, right? And because of that, we'll hurt each other, will stray occasionally from the Lord, and we need to be quick to repent and turn from those things. And so this is, uh, I, I think sometimes that uh, we, we, we forget this. And, 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 you know, don't be a blame shifter. You know, it's interesting if you were to compare King David with King Ahab, right? Uh, when, when David was confronted with his sin of, of uh, doing his census of the people, you know, and and the sin there was just simply maybe relying on their numbers, right? On how big we are and that kind of thing. And, and so here's what David's response was when the Lord was judging the people for taking the census. David's response, 2 Samuel 24, 17. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. He was owning it. He's the one that ordered the census. He was owning this. Do you see that? So we need to be people who are quick to own our, the sin that's ours and repent of that. And if we know Christ as Savior, we're cleansed by the blood, but we still need to repent, right? And some of that is deeds that are in keeping with repentance. If I've sinned against someone, then I need to try to pursue reconciliation with them and make that right and admit my wrong. 
ask forgiveness, all of that, right? And so we need to make sure that we are like David here, right? Um, the other thing I just thought about um, is that we really need to be ruthless about anything that would threaten our wholehearted devotion to God. Ruthless. Um, some people, when they read this passage, and I know we haven't gotten there yet, but when we read, they read the passage and they see at the end where they took out the prophets of Baal and slaughtered them, they're like, they're like oh, Christians don't do that, right? Well, there's a lot to be said about that particular thing, but one thing at the very least we could say is those people led people astray. They led them to idol worship, right? Uh, God will not have that. And it shows how serious God is about having our whole heart, right? And so think about Jesus' statements here in Matthew chapter 5. He says, if your right hand causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the members, one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Do you see what he's saying? How serious, anything that would keep you from the Lord, anything that would keep you from the Lord, anything that would encroach upon your relationship with God, we need to be ruthless, right? And examine ourselves and see, is there, is there something? Is there some habit? Is there some relationship? Is there something that I'm reading or watching that's encroaching upon and influencing my relationship with God in a negative way? If it is, I need to cut that off. And some of that might be different for each of us, right? Because some things are just neutral in and of themselves, but become idols for us individually. So you and I need to have an honest conversation with the Lord God and say, examine my heart, God, and see if there's something not right within me. Is there something that's getting in the way between me and you or has gotten in the way? And ask the Lord just to help you be totally open to whatever he puts his finger on or brings to your attention. Or sometimes he might use someone else to bring it to your attention. And then may God give us humility to receive that and then evaluate it to see if it's true. So uh, we, we could see here that you know, we need to be ruthless about how we deal with our relationship with God, and that is nothing encroaching upon it. Right? All right, let's move to the next section here, uh, see what happens next. Starting in verse 19. So Elijah is still speaking. He says, he's meeting with Ahab. He says, now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who are supported by Jezebel. Verse 20, so Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to the Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, here's the question, how much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. Isn't that, I mean, he just, you got to love Elijah, man. We're not, we're, not, uh, we're not politically correct here at all. Elijah is just both guns blazing and says, this is the problem, people. It's interesting, he gathers everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed I'm amazed that Ahab was able, or excuse me, that Ahab actually relented and gathered all the people. I mean, think about that. If you went into a country and said, hey, uh, get all your people together, you'd say, no, this guy's going to give a message out to everybody that I don't want him to hear. But God's in control, man. He's, he's like, his prophet is there and his guns are blazing and he's saying, listen, you guys are mixing and matching Baalism with the wor worship of the true God. This can happen. You've got to decide. Whose side are you on? This is what he's saying. Interesting. Then it says, but the people were completely silent. Wow. I'm guessing a, a spirit of conviction fell on all these people. 
but we're not at the point of repentance yet. Okay? Just silence. Total silence. Verse 20, so Ahab, uh, excuse me, keep going. Verse 22, the, and Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who's left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Now bring two bowls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting, on fire, setting fire to it. I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on the wood of the altar, but not set fire to it. So we're going to have a showdown, right? We're gonna, these guys are going to uh, put an offering out here, uh, and the prophets of Baal are going to have their altar, and then Elijah's going to set up his altar and so on, right? He says, verse 24, Then call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people agreed. All right, so we got the terms agreed to what's happening. In verse 25, Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, You go first. For there are many of you. Choose one of the bowls and prepare it. And call on the name of your God, but do not set fire to the wood. So they prepared one of the bowls and placed it on the altar, then called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, O Baal, answer us. But there was no reply. The people were silent, and Baal was silent. Isn't that interesting? They danced, hobbled around the altar they had made. I just <laughs> hobbled around the altar. Now, I don't know if this is a, a type of some kind of a ritual dance that they're doing or something, trying to see if they can get in touch with Baal. Verse 27, about noontime, Elijah began mocking them. You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed. For surely he is a god. Perhaps he is daydreaming or is relieving himself. There's a good one. Or maybe he is on a trip, or he is asleep and needs to be wakened. He's just, he's just really blasted at these guys, like, you know, because he knows it's not real. These people are worshiping this false god. He's like, you guys, just you know, wake him up. Or maybe he's on the potty or whatever. He's, he's busy, on vacation. Yell louder. So they shouted louder, verse 28. And following their normal custom, they cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. So cutting you know, was a thing to, to try to reach out to their God. They raved all afternoon until the evening sacrifice, but still there was no sound, no reply, no response. Verse 30, then Elijah called to the people, come over here, come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord. This is significant, all right? Their altar was torn down, right? The one where they offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Elijah is going to put it together here in a, in, in a fashion that would be acceptable to the Lord. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So he repaired the altar and that had been torn down. Verse 31, he took 12 stones one to represent each of the tribes of Israel and use the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar, large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, and laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four large jars of water and pour the water over the offering in the wood. Right? He's wetting it down. After they had done that, he said, do the same thing again. So fill the jars up again. Drench it with water, right? Wood, the animal, everything, right? And when they finished, he said, now do it a third time. So three times. It says, and the water ran around the altar and even filled that trench. This thing is drenched, okay? You know how hard it was raining when you guys came into service last week? <laughs> it was, you were drenched. This whole, this, this altar and everything around it is saturated. The wood I mean, it's just not, you know, it's not something you want to take camping with you, right? Because it's not going to light. That's the point, right? This is like an impossible thing to light this sacrifice now. The other thing is, and this is my speculation, I think that he had all the people gather around him closely because, like, we're not going to have any reports of, oh, he did a trick. He pulled what fast one on us. He was doing something back there. No, no, no. 
this is all real. All real. And then it says, verse 36, at, at the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people, listen to this, answer me so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Isn't that interesting? He's, you know, Elijah, in his prayer at the end there, he's just saying, God, do this. Because what's happening? A sacrifice. Atonement. Right, this is more than a showdown here. This is a sacrifice. Right? right? Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. I really think what's happening is God is offering here, through his prophet Elijah, a path to repentance. Even after all they've done. He finishes his prayer in verse 38. says, Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stone, and the dust. <laughs> How do you burn dust? But it burned. Okay? And then it says, uh, and it even the NLT says, licked up all the water in the trench. In other words, it just evaporated all that water that was in there. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Right? And this is mission accomplished. God's trying to restore his people to himself here and into a right relationship, right? The God of the covenants keeping his side of the bargain, even though his people have departed from him. And after this is done, and the people, it seems to have repented here, it says, then Elijah commanded, seize all the prophets of Baal, don't let a single one escape. So the people seized them all, and Elijah took them down to the Kishon Valley and killed them there. Again, these people were probably all involved also in rounding up the prophets of God, guilty of murder themselves. So, what can we take away from this? I think the main, the main idea here in that section, you guys, is you can't sit on the fence. <laughs> you can't sit on the fence, right? When, when, he is, when Elijah is there uh, issuing his, his, his question, right? How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If, it's Baal, if, if Baal is the Lord, follow him. Well, obviously, Baal's not it. Baal's a big... Loser, okay, failure. He's a false god, right? And they, he's proven this. And so I think what the Lord might have us do is to say, ask you, are you a fence sitter? Have you really chosen to follow the Lord? Or do you just want... Uh, do you want just kind of the good things that Jesus can give you, but not really the hard things that also go with following Jesus? Are you a fence sitter? And it's challenging. But, you know, Jesus, when he called people to follow him, you know, it was not like, hey, let's go have fun together. No, it was like, hey, let's come and die. Not just physically, but, you know, they were going to have to die to themselves. They were going to have to learn what it means to really be uh, a follower of Jesus, to lay down your life for others, right? And to preach the gospel uh, when it's welcome and when it's not, in season and out of season, right? These guys in, the, in, the, in that first century church, they knew about this. They, they realized, you know, to choose to follow Jesus is a big thing. It's not just some, some uh, oh yeah, that sounds like a nice idea. I think I'll do that. You know? No, this is a major decision. And so the question again just remains, right? Are, are you willing to go all in with Jesus? There's a couple other times I thought about in the scriptures where 
God's prophet or his people are challenged. Questioning, are you going to be all in for the Lord or not? Moses, in Exodus 32, says, Then Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, Who's on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. You know, he's, he's challenging. Are you with the Lord or not? Are you following him or not? It can't be half in, half out. Because really, fence setting has made the choice to not follow God. Right? Has not made the choice yet to follow God. And then Joshua also challenges uh, the people of God. He says, if it is evil in in uh, in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's not just a nice little coffee cup phrase or something you put on your door knocker. This is the real question that we all have to wrestle with. Am I all in for Jesus? Will I go where he sends me? Will I do what he asks me to do? Will I live my marriage the way he wants it to be lived? Will I use my finances the way he wants them to be used? Will I serve and love people the way he wants me to? Will I be committed to my local body, the church, where he wants me to worship? And not just show up when it's convenient. You know, I tell you what, if I wasn't a pastor, I probably would have been here today. Because last night I was saying, you know, I just want to go to work tomorrow. I said that to my wife. You can ask her. I said, I don't want to go to work tomorrow. You know, I said, I don't want to go there. And it's just, I'm just being real because I'm like you. I just have a different job. But I do know before I was a pastor, yeah, there were days where like you're just dragging the kids to church. You know, you're lucky to be here and their kids are lucky to be, your kids are lucky to be alive when they got here. Amen? Amen. Yeah. All right. I I hear you. It's, It's a battle, man. So I want you to know every Sunday is a spiritual battle, people you got to have your armor on because the enemy does not want you to just even don the doors to worship. Coming and gathering here is an act of worship. I I don't get extra pay if you show up, okay? It's about our worship. That's about, that's what it is to follow Jesus. We gather together. We worship Him. We lift Him up. We hear His Word. We fellowship. We encourage one another. We challenge one another. This is the life that we've been called to. It's not meant to be a matter of convenience. It's a matter of obedience to the life He's called us. It's challenging. It's hard sometimes. It is. Jesus himself said this, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. He laid it down. You're either with Jesus or you're not. He's either your Lord or he's not. And that's the challenge. Today's not one of those fuzzy messages. It's not. I mean, Elijah's throwing down, and he's challenging the people. So we can't go through this passage without being challenged ourselves. We wouldn't be true to the Scriptures if we didn't get a challenge from this. And I really think that, you know, this is not a one-and-done thing. Like where you say, you know, I'm really, yeah, God, I know I've been kind of dabbling with the world. I'm, I'm, I'm back in, all in. This is like a daily thing. It's like, It's like you're putting yourself up on that altar in a sense, right? Like it says in Romans 12, right? Romans 12, 1, basically in light of 
the gospel in the light of God's goodness and mercy that he's shown us in Christ, in the light of the fact that we're totally lost and in need of a Savior, he says, and so, dear brothers, I plead with you, give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that will be find, he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. In other words, the, truly the way to worship God is to give him your everything, your body, your eyes, your lips, your mouth, your hands, your feet, your children, everything, all in. That's what he's asking every day. And so I, that's why I say it's not a one and done thing. Because there are times where we kind of crawl, slither off the altar. <laughs> say, man, life is too hard, Lord, following Jesus. This is, you know, forgiving this person over here, that's too hard. Making things right in this relationship, God, that's too hard. And then we realize, you know what? Wow, I need to forgive like I've been forgiven. <laughs> I need to follow the scripture that says, as much as it depends upon me, be at peace with all men. You know, whatever it is, the scripture calls us to it. Right? We need to follow it. And so I really think that is the message there of our, of our second big chunk of Scripture. And you know what I want to do is I, I just want to stop there. And I want to spend some time praying with you guys. Okay? And then we're going to go to worship. And I want you to think about, you know that song that we sang earlier, I Will Give You All My Worship? Right? I'll give you all my worship. All you think about that. Give him your all, okay? Because, you know, I can always make this a part two next week. <laughs> That's the beauty of running the show up here. That's what's going to happen because uh, we're going to get to that prayer he prays, okay? Let's go to the Lord right now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. When it comforts and when it inflicts on us, what we need when we when we need a harsh word, when we uh, and that's what this passage does. It challenges God, and so Lord, if we've been fence uh, fence sitters, any of us sitting on the fence, Lord, I pray that we, your Holy Spirit would draw us off the fence and totally over into the Jesus column, the following Jesus, all in, all we've got, our heart, soul, mind, and strength, all for Him. Whatever that means. We, we don't even know what that means. What you might lead us to do. Father, Lord, help us also just to realize, you know what? We're not going to, not everybody's going to like us when we take the message of the gospel. Not everybody's going to like us when we say we love Jesus and he's an important part of our lives. He's our everything. He's at the center. Not everybody's going to like that. Some people, though, when we share that good news or when we're being a light like Jesus would be, they're going to be attracted to that. It's going to be, the, uh, as the scripture says, the aroma of Christ. But to those who are rejecting Christ, it says that we will be the aroma of death to them. And we don't know who is who, Lord. But God, we just want to be all in for you. And we want to realize that we're not going to be liked by everybody. And we're certainly not going to go out of our way to be hated by people. We just want to be faithful to you. And Father, if any, if any of us need to repent of something today, Lord, if there's something that's not right in our heart, Lord, help us to own it. Let us not be like Ahab, who's shifting the blame. He's not owning his sin. Let us be honest with you, God. And we thank you that there is an atoning sacrifice because of what your son Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. He was the perfect sacrifice. It's his blood that truly cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we will put our faith in him, if we will acknowledge our need for him and repent of our sin, we will sit under the constant flood of the blood of Jesus, which washes us white as snow. And that's the God we serve. 
Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, not to waver between two opinions, but to be all in for you. Lord, we want to do this as an, an expression as we sing now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. If you're comfortable standing, let's stand and sing.
is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any John 8, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And let's sing, follow you anywhere. Jesus, all I want is you. Where are you? 